Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 6th, our first session back from a lengthy break. Today's topic is HyperDocs Digital Lesson Design Using Google Apps. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Also thank you to Patty Ruffing for doing the new Collaborate introduction that's in the Live Binder as well as the PD certificates for us. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy who will introduce today's special guests. Hello to all of you and welcome back to the new school year. If you're in the United States, I know there are some countries that this is not the beginning of a new school year for you, but we're so glad to have all of you with us. The start of a new school year is always such an exciting time of year, both for teachers and students. And I could even add parents to that. We're so excited to kick off the year following our summer break with this team of very innovative educators who are going to share their fantastic instructional tool called HyperDocs. Lisa Highfield, Sarah Landis, and Kelly Hilton are the creators of this tool. And I can't wait to have you hear all about what it is, how it works, and how you can use it in your classroom or even for professional development with other teachers. I used to teach my pre-service teachers how to use a Word document to create something we called a launch page. Some of you may have heard of that many years ago. And they use it for creating lessons with students. HyperDocs takes this to a much higher level of in student engagement and interactive learning. Technology has advanced so much in recent years, and now we have the opportunity to facilitate learning in much more creative ways that really help learners to take control over their own learning. Well, ever since I learned about HyperDocs from our advisory team member, Maureen Tomenis, I was hooked. And I have started lurking, stalking, following every webinar and hangout on there they have offered. And I know you're going to be inspired and hooked once you see the incredible potential of this free tool today. All of them are from uh, Pleasanton Unified District in California. Lisa is a K-12 instructional technology coach. Sarah is also an instructional coach. And Kelly is too. So we have some real, real tech experts with us today. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarah has uh, a master's in curriculum from Teachers College, Columbia University, and she currently shares her passion for global literacy, digital storytelling, and blended learning with learners of all ages. Uh, Lisa um, actively works to share and collaborate with teachers, parents, and community members actually globally. It's not just in her community. And um, Kelly has taught in the classroom for 15 years and is currently a, an instructional coach. As a teacher, her classroom served as a laboratory for educators to be able to come in and observe reading and writing workshop and blended learning. And now she's dedicated to coaching K-12 teachers daily in all subject areas on student-centered instructional design and delivery practices. So welcome, Lisa, Sarah, and Kelly. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And to get started, I'm going going to ask Lisa to answer our newbie question, and then they'll take over and continue with their presentation. So here's our newbie question. Why is it important to use digital tools to provide multimedia experiences for students? Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much, Peggy. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to be here speaking with everyone at Classroom 2.0 Live. Um, you know, we have different kinds of students in our classrooms these days. I know they use the term digital 
native often, but it's so exciting to see how we can really maximize the use of digital tools to transform our classroom learning experiences in ways that we just didn't do. I started teaching over 20 years ago, and it, I think this is one of the most exciting times in the, um, to be in the classroom. We are very excited to share with you what HyperDocs are, and it was neat to see that a lot of you hadn't heard of them before. Um, and so what we'd love to do throughout this um, program is to help define it for you, uh, show you how to get started making some yourself, and then most importantly, um, we're going to get into how to elevate them so that they are very uh, transformative um, uh, activities that can happen in your classroom. Um, let's see, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, so what, what started happening in our district, uh, we were all classroom teachers for many years, many, many years, um, teaching, um, all, I think all of us were fifth grade teachers, and we were starting to get technology in the classroom. They were bringing in um, carts full of Chromebooks, and we were so excited, except for it was testing. You know, it's for testing, but you know, we'll take technology any way we can get it. And we noticed that a lot of people were not sure how to manage this with a full classroom of kids, you know, especially the lower grades, you know, and then um, being digitally safe with the older grades. We were noticing people were um, writing up on the board a URL and taking them to, um, you know, consuming uh, websites where you would just consume information or play games. And we really felt like there's so much more you can maximize um, uh, learning in the classroom. Well, we also understand that if this is, um, you know, my manifesto for teaching these days, and I keep adding to it because these are the things that we're expected to do in our classroom all at once, along with, you know, if you're teaching middle school, 180 students, if you are um, teaching in a contained classroom, you've got your 30 students, and for those who are coaching and working with staff, you've got hundreds of people that you are trying to help them to be doing this in the classroom. So with all of that, we knew this is what teachers have on their plate. And we know we feel like you're always adding something new to the plate. And if you look at it this way, and you look at it like, oh my gosh, you're adding more corn to my plate. I don't have any more room on the plate. We wanted to shift this thinking. I really started to see it as, could we change our mindset and look at it differently? What if we took everything we had on our plate and made it into something different, something that was manageable, something that we could handle. Because really when it comes down to it, this is the people that matter the most. This is why we are working on HyperDocs and sharing with you today because these people, are my, this is my former Highfield crew, these are all that matter. And we want learning to be engaging and interactive and exciting for them. And so we came up with an idea. And that idea was HyperDocs. Now, in order to clearly define what a HyperDoc is, um, we have this great graphic that um, one of our um, online class students, Carrie Wilson, created for us. And it really explains it in such a clear way. They are transformative digital lesson that shifts the focus from teacher-led lecture to student-driven inquiry-based learning through exploration. You're probably thinking, oh my gosh, how does all that happen in one single lesson? Well, another part that is very important is up around the light bulb. We want kids to engage and explore and explain and reflect and share and apply their knowledge. It all happens um, through great lesson design. And I have to say, many of us think, you know, wow, I've been doing this for years. It sounds like a web quest or, um, you know, and I'm sure everyone has. All we did was sort of put some definition behind it and, uh, you know, wrote about it and, and built the pedagogy because we really felt that innovation using um, digital tools in the classroom can only happen when you really marry content, pedagogy, along with the tool. We've heard forever that it's not about the tool, then that's where we need to change things. So here is a HyperDoc. This is a, um, one that I've um, used often. And it's just a Google document that has clear expectations. It has the, um, you know, instructions for students that they can come back to often um, and look at without me having to repeat instructions. They know exactly what's expected. It has built-in um, collaboration on the document. I also call another word for that is classroom management. 
Um, my students were broken into four groups. Each group had a, a Google presentation that they were working on down below. Um, and no one was searching their drive, trying to find where their, um, where their uh, presentation was. And when you go on to the slides, it was scaffolded for them. It was the beginning of the year activity, and so it was important that I helped them um, to figure out how to do that. Um, and then down below, the resources were curated. These are 10-year-olds. I didn't want them off on Google searching uh, and wasting a lot of time. That was not the point of this activity. I curated it for them. Um, and that's an important part that I created this. I was the architect of this learning experience. This is what I wanted my students to uh, accomplish at that time. And I was able to package it and put it together for them. Let's look at some of our old lessons. Now, I don't know. I, don't, I hope this isn't anyone's syllabus out there. But does it look familiar? What's the first thing that you think a student would seek out here? Is it the due date in bold? Do you think that this lesson is engaging or inspiring or innovative? One prominent feature of a hybrid dog is how it looks. Now, I know it's not the most important part, but I'm, I want you to um, think for yourself as I go through this next little section. Think about how the packaging of a, a lesson can really affect learning. Well, I really believe that hyperdocs have a lot to do with packaging. It's where packaging meets pedagogy. You know, you've got the visual effect. You can build in um, collaboration. No more lost papers in the backpacks. Um, you can in build in inquiry learning, uh, inspire curiosity. And my favorite part, you can constantly be changing it um, to fit your needs. I really am looking to build um, uh, lessons uh, that, that really emphasize um, the best in our students. I, I really truly believe students are curious by nature. And we need to provide opportunities for them to be curious. They're amazing problem solvers when we give them the opportunity to create rather than just consume or just listen. When we give them time to talk to each other rather than sit passively. They just need inspiration. And this is where your craft as a teacher comes in. One Google Doc. What would you put on it to inspire your students? So look, here is the same syllabus, just remastered. After an extreme pedagogy makeover is what we like to call them, in HyperDoc form. Images and links to the current digital books and reviews are posted to inspire curiosity. We put words like click here to see what you get to do as you read the book and an opportunity to post your thinking on collaborative sites that are going to connect you with other readers in your class. Is this more engaging? Are you curious now to try out this lesson? Think how the instructional methods have changed now for this course. When you look at something like, you know, when I uh, was first trying to change my pedagogy and how I delivered instruction, I first started off with a multimedia tech set. And you know, this kind of does look like a Google Doc with links, but it is a start that will really change your, um, the way you teach. This is not a HyperDoc, but it is a very uh, great beginning. It's a Google Doc that lets you explore um, a lot of different kinds of content um, without doing the lecture. So let's say I have um, a topic like Earth in Action. Um, you know, we want to pull all of our um, best resources and, and build a graphic organizer full of quality content um, that kids can find in one easy location before teaching in a unit on Earth in Action. We want to build schema and background knowledge. And that's really key to comprehending when we get to the heart of the lesson, which is the HyperDoc. HyperDoc is the actual lesson. But you spend days lecturing on how avalanches occur or the difference between earthquakes. And it takes up so much of your quality face time with students. So what if you gave the students all of these pieces? Why not give all the resources to them to explore in any order, order they wish, like different types of media from nonfiction articles to videos to images, along um, you know, with this, have an expectation of students sharing what they've discovered and what they've learned and what they now wonder about the topic. Um, this can be um, done together with a whole class for parts of it, um, or independently, or in pairs. And rather than lecture the basics for each topic, why not ask kids how each of them relate to one another? Inspire students to connect thinking. How are these forces in Earth in action uh, work together to shape our planet? 
Now, this is just one piece of a hyperdoc. That's the explore section that Sarah and Kelly are going to get into in a minute. I just wanted to show you, though, that that is the first way to change the way you are delivering your content. Um, you know, hyperdocs and tech sets have a profound ability to change that. How to move away from the front of the room lecture and provide opportunities for your students to exercise actual 21st century skills now that we're 16 years into that. Um, you know, I think it's so important to give a concrete solution to teachers. Instead of just using buzzwords and saying you should do it, we've actually created a structure that you can follow step by step. Um, we want students to be creative and collaborate and critical thinkers and communicators. But then we ask them to sit quietly while we explain everything and tell them exactly how it's to be done. It's time to shift that focus. And I think hyperdocs are doing a great job. I do warn you, though, a hyperdoc lesson is much more than some links on a document. But they can easily lack innovation and become a fancy digital worksheet. In order to avoid this, I am always asking myself this question. What is it that I could do now that I couldn't do before? I'm going to leave you with that thought. It really is key to creating a powerful learning experience for your students that will transform your classes. And I will now um, hand this off to Sarah. Thank you. It's great to be with you guys today. Um, this is Sarah, and Lisa has had a chance to explain the history and pedagogy behind HyperDocs and digital lesson design. What I would love to do today is share with you the nitty gritty of how to create a HyperDoc. We've basically condensed the process down to these uh, five steps. It's really a series of, a de of decisions that you make as a teacher. Thinking through these key things will help you create a HyperDoc that is not only student-centered, but also demonstrates sound pedagogy. So those five steps quickly are determine your objectives, uh, determine learning cycle, determine some packaging, consider your workflow, and then get into design. Next, I was hoping to um, explain to you a bit more about um, determining objectives. This is probably the easiest step in the creation process. These snap decisions you make will guide you through the basics of your HyperDoc content. Quick tip for you when first getting going with HyperDoc, start with one that has a low cognitive load. Um, step back and observe your students' learning. So you may choose um, a lesson that's fairly simple in, in content so that you have a chance to um, observe the kind of process of learning on a HyperDoc. Step two is determining your cycle of learning. During this step, you'll decide uh, which cycle is most appropriate for your lesson. If you teach science, for example, you may choose a 5 E's approach. If you teach in a district who implements the workshop model for ELA, you may choose to develop a HyperDoc with that teaching cycle in mind. We've even developed our own basic HyperDoc model, which has uh, seven key components, and that would include engage, explore, explain, apply, share, reflect, and extend. Um, quick tip on step two of the creation process. If you're new to HyperDocs, we encourage you to start with the Explore Explain Apply model. This is one that can be accomplished in a shorter period of time generally, and we find that a lot of teachers that are getting going with HyperDocs uh, feel really successful with the short 45 to an hour um, lesson. Next step in the process is to consider your packaging. So what you would do here is decide which Google app you want to package your HyperDoc on. Do you want to stick with Docs because you feel comfortable with it? Do you want to use Slides for its advanced design features? Maybe you'll try Maps for a social studies or geography lesson. Develop a HyperDoc on site because you want to create a thematic unit of study. Decide which packaging option is best for your lesson. Quick tip you might want to start with whatever Google app you feel most comfortable with. I know when we were first getting going with HyperDocs, we would use Docs, and then eventually moved into Slides, and have gone on from there. The next step in the creation process is step four, where you really have to decide which workflow option is best for you. Unfortunately, this is a very personal process. And it's hard for us to answer individual workflow options. But we've realized that deciding on these three factors first will help you find the right fit for your own teaching needs. To push out content, you might use Google Classroom, you might share a shortened URL address, 
or offer a forced copy to your students. To collect the work, you can use Google Classroom again. You might use a Google Form or some other method. We think it's helpful, too, to consider whether or not you'll be offering feedback somehow during the HyperDoc assignment in the way of commenting, face-to-face -face communication, or otherwise. A little tip um, in getting going with step four and determining which workflow is best for you, whatever you decide, you probably want to do your best to start the year off with that launch plan um, so that you and your students can get acquainted with um, the workflow norms for your classroom. All right, uh, step five is probably my favorite step. This is where you, oh my gosh, this is where the fun kicks in. It's time to design your HyperDoc. So you're going to get an opportunity to pull on all that you know using Google design features. Uh, we have found that tried and true graphic design principles really come in handy when designing a HyperDoc. Uh, you'll want to consider font choices, color combinations, the power of images, and more. Using tables, customizable links, and other tech features, you can really design a memorable learning experience for your students. Also, during the design step, you can pull in your personality and really start to talk to your students at their level. Um, and honestly, this is the part where you not only lose hours of your life because you start designing and, and time goes by because you're having such a good time, but you just have fun with it. Talk to your students, put your humor and sense of uh, personality into designing your um, your lesson plans for kids. Okay, so, you know, we've been, um, you know, introducing HyperDocs to educators around the globe for a while now, and we've basically found that there's just three ways to get started. So we thought we would kind of share some of that with you a little bit today. The three basic ways, um, again, as a teacher, you have a choice on how you want to get going, but here's your options. You can start with one of our templates. You can take someone else's HyperDoc that you've seen and remix it to fit your own classroom needs. Or you can start from scratch with a new Google Doc, Slides, Map, or Google Sites. So let's look at templates a bit more. Templates um, really allow you to select a cycle of learning and find the templates that work to get going. Once you've chosen a template, all you have to do is click File, Make a Copy, and the template is yours to work with. This one you're looking at now is our basic HyperDoc template. This is the one that we designed after doing our own research and really thinking about uh, lesson design and how we're able to pull in digital elements that we couldn't do before. So we may have um, a connection or a hook, which might be like a really engaging video or a meme or a graphic of some sort. We may um, have some direct instruction moment for the teach and the learn section or have some tutorial videos linked up for our kids. Um, then we would get into some sort of engagement activity and, and go on from there. So um, what's nice about starting with one of these templates is that the learning cycle and the theory of, of lesson design is kind of built in for you, which is really nice. Um, what we love um, about the templates as well, um, what I've linked up here for you actually is a way to see what a template might start out as on the left hand side and then on the right is how this uh, HyperDoc can be transformed based on what it is that you're teaching and what your design might look like. So here's an example of um, a basic template on the left and a creative writing challenge and how that lesson in that HyperDoc really morphed into um, fitting that teacher's needs. Um, again, you can find these templates and the samples that I'm showing you here on our website at hyperdocs.co, all you have to do is click on the template and simply file, make a copy, and it's yours to work with. Here's the 5Es template, here's a workshop model template, here's a fun one that we created with the hero's journey, it's a take on the 5Es model, and we find a lot of um, educators actually use these templates um, when um, doing PD as well. So. As I mentioned, another way to get started using templates is to remix someone else's. So oftentimes we get inspired by the work of someone else. That's the same is true with HyperDocs. Or simply another teacher has created a HyperDoc for a lesson idea that we had in mind as well. So let's say you see an ancient Greece HyperDoc, um, but you wanted to create one for ancient China. All you have to do is file, make a copy, and start switching out the content to fit your needs.
we want to point out to you this great resource that we've compiled um, called Teachers Give Teachers. This is a really special project that we started. And um, what we were able to do is um, curate um, tons of examples as a start, but then what we found was that teachers were sharing with each other. And so when you log on to teachersgiveteachers.net, again, that's teachersgiveteachers.net, you'll have an opportunity to give a HyperDoc away or take a HyperDoc. Here you can upload your own lessons that you've created for others to use. You can also take one by searching for a HyperDoc lesson that someone else has shared. We find that creating HyperDocs can take time, so we really believe in the philosophy of sharing. Within our site, you can search a hashtag such as fourth grade or chemistry or American Revolution. And then this bank of digital lessons is a way to crowdsource the great work that's being done out there so that we as educators are working better together and really for the benefit of reaching more and more students. So we really encourage you to not only um, start creating HyperDocs, but also to feel comfortable enough to share them so that others can begin using them as well. So hopefully we will see you um, on teachersgiveteachers.net. All right, the last way to begin a HyperDoc is to start from scratch. Um, of course, you can always start from the beginning. So if you already have a vision for your HyperDoc in mind, you can begin by starting a new doc or slides or other Google app tool to get you going. And we find that once teachers are comfortable using the templates or making a copy of other HyperDocs that they've seen, that they're then ready to start from scratch. So um, I just wanted to point out a few of our favorite creation um, tips and tricks. One of the things that um, we find is that there's just a couple of core design tips that we come back to more and more um, as time goes on. We still love tables. What do we love about creating and adding tables to a HyperDoc? It gets students collaborating all on one doc. You can put you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 kids on one table in a doc, and they can be talking to each other or sharing their thoughts and ideas. You can use a table for note taking, as you can see in this example here. You can use um, a table to organize yourself as the teacher instructionally in terms of like creating a, a graphic organizer. So we still love tables and find that we use them in a myriad of ways all the time. Um, the other thing that we love and continue to come back to is just adding customized links. What that does is it really allows the teacher to talk to the student. So that on the example here it says, want to learn more about Google Drawing? Watch this. So you have an opportunity to actually speak to students by customizing your links and, and really selecting the word choice that would send them directly to a URL. So um, third thing that we continue to love is just images and videos. What better way to engage students than to make learning visual for them? Um, changing page color often creates a mood or a tone for our HyperDocs. So you might find that when HyperDoc has um, you know, a, a deep blue, a sea green, um, if you're doing a HyperDoc on oceans, for example. So um, these are just some, some of our favorite uh, creation design tech tri tips and tricks for you. At the end of the day, what we really want to do is encourage our teachers and educators um, using and creating HyperDocs is just to have fun, be creative. The joy of digital lesson design with HyperDocs is, um, just really urges you to try new things, to take risks, and to have some fun. Of course, um, we also want you to remember that as digital lesson designers and HyperDoc creators, we're all on this journey. Um, you might find yourself at times in stage one where you're learning a new web tool that you want to include. Let's say you want to, you've heard the hype about this, this tool, Padlet, and you want to kind of learn how to use that and then add that onto your HyperDoc. So you might find yourself in stage one. You're just kind of curious. You're crawling around, figuring it out. But then you advance yourself to stage two where you're ready to start creating single lesson plans. You want to start um, practicing workflow or possibly taking um, an old lesson that you've used and reimagining it, kind of like what Lisa shared earlier about um, taking old lessons and, and, and hyperdocking them. Um, perhaps you're ready to look up into stage three and think, what can I do now that I feel comfortable creating single lesson plans? I want to try some new packaging options. I've been using Docs for a while. It's time to move along and start trying slides or even a, create a hyper map. Um, put a series of, of lesson um, objectives on a map. 
Um, maybe you want to get better about um, reflecting on your own progress, stepping back and seeing what's really working in your hyperdoc creation. Or maybe you um, get in a rut. I know I get um, kind of stuck using the same uh, tools all the time. So this progression just really encourages you to look up and think of ways you can, um, you know, uh, improve your own practice as a hyperdoc creator. Um, but also be reminded that sometimes we go back and forth along this progression. And with that, I want to go ahead and introduce Kelly to you. Hopefully these steps and tips and tricks will help you to get creating HyperDocs on your own. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So appreciate all that incredible information. And it is. It's a lot of fun to really think about how you're going to put all of these HyperDocs together. And as Sarah shared, a lot about the designing process and the thinking that goes in to putting your HyperDoc together. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we really think about how they de redefine the student learning experience. Lisa mentioned in the beginning, always keeping in your mind, what is it that I can do now that I couldn't do before? So we do have some ideas about that as well. And when you're creating your hyperdoc, you're really becoming more of a designer. What we're asking people to do is think about what you know about good teaching. Think about what you know about Google Apps or any technology that you have in your classroom, and then think about how are you going to design an experience for your students that will read them, really lead them into that redef redefinition of learning. So when we created our hyperdocs, really I'm asking myself not what am I going to teach today, I'm asking myself how will I design a lesson for learning and how will the students show me what they have learned. And when I think about how they will show me what they have learned, that's really where the redefinition comes into place. When I first started teaching, my lesson plan started to be in a binder where I would write my lesson in there. And some of the lesson was for me to directly instruct. And some of the lesson was for me to push out on a piece of paper and give to my students. Or there was group work. There's all these components. But with HyperDocs, we think that it's really different because you're putting all of those, they're, t they're coming out of your lesson plan book, and they're all being packaged on the doc. And they're given to students. They're really created for the students. So where previously you might have shared a video, or previously you might have um, shown an image or something that only the teacher had access to, the, t the student has access to all parts of the lesson plan now when you put it on the HyperDoc. So keeping all of this in mind, um, a 21st century educator has these guidelines that we all have to consider. And if you haven't heard of it before, there's something called the SAMR model. And it's really one of the guidelines that is out there that is for, for teachers to consider how they're using technology, are they using it for enhancement or to transformation. And another guideline that teachers are considering when they're in the classroom today is uh, the DOK levels and the critical thinking levels of how the students are applying their learning. And the third guideline that uh, we want to address today are the ISTE standards. And the ISTE standards are really available through the International Society for Technology and Education. And they actually have student standards, teacher standards, coach standards. And they're all things that we think HyperDocs um, kind of blend with in the sense that we all were considering all of these as we started to de continue to design our HyperDocs. So when, what we did is we took all three of those uh, guidelines that are available already to teachers, and we put them together. We packaged them on a HyperDoc checklist. So this is our HyperDoc checklist. And this is sort of a way that we really think about our lesson design and is it redefining the learning. On the left hand side is the page for transformation. And on the right hand side of this slide is the page for enhancement. So we're just going to zoom in for a moment on the enhancement slide. And so if you think about, um, yes, technology does just enhance the learning sometimes. And not all hyperdocs are transformational. So really, this checklist was more of a way for us to be having conversations about how we're using the technology, but it also um, helps others have you know, a way to just understand our thinking behind it. So with all of those standards on this checklist, on the left-hand column is the SAMR standard. 
And on the right-hand column is the depth of knowledge standard. So you can see level one below and level two above. So here's what I think of when I think of that checklist page. That was an enhancement uh, use of technology. When I go into the computer lab, I, this is what I started to do when I first started teaching. I would have my 45 minutes in the computer lab, and we might go into the lab and spend some time, sometimes creating a PowerPoint, sometimes just looking at one web page, sometimes working on a package program that someone other than myself created for my students. And did it enhance our learning? Well, sure, it did. Um, however, uh, you know, I, with the, everything that's available today, we think we can take this a lot further with HyperDocs. And our labs are definitely a great place to go in and use the HyperDocs, but it's how we're using the lab, which is different with a HyperDocs. The second part of the page is the transformation on the checklist. So when you take a look at the checklist, on the, uh, I'm going to kind of go through all four quadrants. And the bottom left-hand quadrant talks about how is the technology that you're using and you're putting on your HyperDocs modifying the learning? And also, is it also providing an opportunity for students' critical thinking to be at a level three for their, their uh, depth of knowledge? So I'm going to show you this quick example of a HyperDoc that I think kind of fits those two sections on the checklist. Now, believe me, we, the three of us, have created this checklist, and we've had so many conversations debating the contents of our HyperDocs. So we really encourage you to go do the same, and you can still debate with us as well. Because really what we're talking about is just being thoughtful in our pedagogy. Um, but there's never, never like anything that we're saying that is exact. So take a look at this HyperDoc here. On this, this is a, a zoomed in section of a digital literacy HyperDoc. So really it's meeting the needs of students practicing their digital literacy and developing it, which is at the uh, modification stage for Stammer model. Additionally, Students have to cite the evidence to support their thinking, which is like the depth of knowledge level, level three. Notice though, if you zoom in a little bit closer on the direction, students are using a Chrome extension, Read and Write for Google, and they're basically practicing a close reading activity on this HyperDoc. So the directions are on there. Um, there's a link to the thinking strategies, which had already been previously taught. Students are allowed to go through their three reads, the first read using Google Read, read and Write for Google. The second read, students are going to read through the text, which is pasted onto the page, and they're going to highlight new vocabulary and define words and use the parts of Google Docs that will allow them to define the vocabulary for themselves in teaching those independent literacy skills. And then in the third read, they're going to go ahead and jot their thinking in the table on the right-hand side. So a pretty simple concept and definitely a lesson that could start modifying the use of technology and meet those, uh, those content skills that we all have to consider when we're teaching in a classroom today. So let's move to another example. If you go back to the checklist, there is the top two quadrants where the top left-hand one talks about the redefinition of learning, and the right-hand side talks about level four DOK. So let me show you an example of what I think might fit into that category on our checklist. This is another HyperDoc activity used for math. And you'll notice our design. The first one I showed you had a, doc, a Google Doc with a table, and as Sarah mentioned, we do love our tables. This is a math HyperDoc that has a Google Doc with a table. And simply, uh, when this lesson was designed, the questions came from the curriculum that was assigned to the teacher's classroom. And they're already considered um, extension questions with higher level thinking. So that's where it fits the DLK4. And they're just copied and pasted into the Google Doc. So at that time, um, why would we put this onto a Google Doc? Why, why wouldn't, wouldn't the students just 
do it in the classroom on a piece of paper as normal. So what, what's kind of hidden in this lesson is what I'm going to show you on the next page. In fact, well, let me go back here. If you read the directions, it says you're going to be completing the math application problem. And when you are ready to show your work, when you're ready to show what you have learned, you are going to click here. And when you click here, it takes you to this next slide here. This next slide is called Show What You Know Bingo. So this is where the students were allowed to choose a tool that they feel comfortable using. And they could create uh, their, their answer to their math question and link it back onto the HyperDoc. For example, EduCreations here is this uh, one tool where students can talk write and speak into the app. It's on, a, it's on an iPad and it's on a Chromebook. So depending on what devices you have in your classroom, this works for both. So what, what happens in this lesson is the students are thinking, answering the math question, speaking and listening, talking their answers, showing the steps that they took in order to answer the problem, and then linking it back onto the HyperDoc. So to us, we felt like, well, this is really starting to redefine the learning experience. And as a teacher, it really helped me differentiate. In fact, I was able to go back and watch my students' videos and see all of their thinking and really pinpoint exactly where they were at and what they needed help with and which steps they were forgetting to take when it came to applying their math skills. So, Let's think back to that computer lab example photo that I had a couple of slides ago. That is one awesome way to use HyperDocs. But with the with the HyperDocs and all the Chromebooks coming into classrooms more or students bringing in devices, classrooms are starting to look more like this. With students collaborating, creating, more movement built in. Our devices are portable. It's time to make our HyperDocs and our lessons uh, very, you know, movement oriented as well in a blended learning classroom. So on this slide, I'd like to just highlight what we've done in our book, the HyperDoc Handbook. Because as Sarah mentioned, we've come up with our HyperDoc template that kind of talks through the ways that our pedagogy is in using the digital lesson design. But in our book, you'll find a section called uh, How to Build Your HyperDoc. And in that section, at the top, we share how we are using the tool. In this example, here's a YouTube video. It was a way to engage the learners and get them going um, on the topic that was being taught. And in the section of this book, that's what we have at the top. But there's seven different sections with examples for you and multiple HyperDocs for you to have access to and make copies of. Also on each page in this section, we have uh, broken down our thinking for you to help you create your own. How did we design our HyperDoc? Why did we choose those design choices? How did we deliver instruction using it? And how do we collect the work? And then on the left-hand column of the pages in the book, we address everything that's on that HyperDoc checklist that I discussed. We address the four C's, the ISTE standards, DOK, and SAMR. What are the students doing on this HyperDoc? And that's just because we want to share our thinking around implementing technology, and we want to hear yours as well. And that's why we created these tools to share with, with you. Another part uh, that's embedded within the Build Your Own HyperDoc section in our book is a zoomed in screenshot of an actual HyperDoc. And we kind of put our thinking around it, why we designed it this way, and how we helped that to um, uh, show the students what they needed to do or how they could go through it and use it for learning. And then once you uh, click on the, well, one thing that's on here too is the URL. So this is the zoomed in screenshot, but once you click on that URL, you would have access to the full HyperDoc that was created, which then you can go and turn file, make a copy of it, and um, make it fit for your classroom needs.
So really, with all of this that we've been explaining today, we just want to um, highlight that it's really become quite a HyperDoc community. We have learned so much from connecting and collaborating with other teachers. People have really pushed our thinking on designs and lessons and new tools. And so what we tried to provide is the, uh, the structure behind thinking about the technology and then also a very inclusive community where we have conversations around digital lesson design. So we have a Teachers Give Teachers Twitter handle. We have the Teachers Give Teachers website, which Sarah mentioned earlier. We have a YouTube channel with some how-tos on there and some um, recorded presentations that we have about talking about HyperDocs. We have a Facebook great group page, so if you're on Facebook, you can join us there. People share HyperDocs. We have conversations there. On Pinterest, that link is pretty, uh, pretty helpful. In fact, I do want to highlight the Pinterest page really quick. When we wrote the book, we had this long conversation about what tools we should put in the book, like how do we lead people to web tools. And we realized it's just not about the tools. And not that we realized it, but really we just recognized it. And that's why we created this Pinterest board. Because what we do there is we have different um, folders for tools that we love that go for different reasons. Like a tool that we love for creating video, a whole folder around that. And we realized that the tools are going to keep changing. And a Pinterest board is a live way to keep our book alive. It's a live way to share with you um, and for all of us to continue to communicate and collaborate as the technology changes around this pedagogy. And the last thing that I want to direct you to is if you want to learn more about how people have been creating and designing HyperDocs, we did do a series of HyperDocs Hangouts on Air, and we interviewed other teachers, and they shared with us their digital lesson design. And let me tell you, there's some amazing educators out there, and they just shared, they just really took this concept and um, took it to another level. So I encourage you to check out those videos as well. And they're 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, if you're interested, we do have the HyperDoc Handbook, which is available on Amazon. And uh, we really enjoyed sharing all these concepts with you. Additionally, this summer, <laughs> we've had such a blast teaching a HyperDoc Boot Camp online course. And this course, uh, students have the book, and we spend four weeks doing Google Hangouts, creating HyperDocs, and really collaborating and connecting teachers across the globe to talk about digital lesson design. Our next cohort begins August 15th, so please feel free to um, join us if you can. It's a pretty great class. So that is pretty much the end of our presentation. Lisa and Sarah and I just feel so grateful to have this time to talk to you and share our thoughts and ideas. We'd love to, I think, shift into having conversations around a lot of the stuff that we've shared. Thanks so much, Kelly and Sarah and Lisa. Uh, I did capture questions as we went. Some the questions were answered as well. Um, first one, I think Lisa answered in chat, but it's worth asking. How is a HyperDoc distributed to individual students? Do students copy a view-only doc, then work on their copies? Um, I can answer that. I can go ahead and um, there's, again, there's so many different ways to do it, but oftentimes we find that teachers will share a link, um, mm -hmm. oftentimes a view-only link, either through a shortened URL, um, and then students will individually make a copy of that HyperDoc, and then um, they have an editable version to work on. Um, <clears throat> that's one way to push it out. Another way to push it out is if you're using Google Classroom, you would um, you would add it as an assignment, and then Google Classroom makes an individual copy for each student with their name on it, and then they, again, have editable rights. Um, those are like the two primary ways. There are certainly other ways. If you're a teacher who maybe uses your website quite a bit, and you just refer your students back to your web website often and say, hey, check out the newest HyperDoc link, you know, blah, 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 
Or if you are bringing kids to the computer lab and you say, check out the latest link that I've added for you there. So there's so many different ways to launch um, the view only docs. But I always think of it as kind of the old fashioned way of you have your Blackline Master worksheet and mm -hmm. you're passing out a copy. So you just need to um, figure out the way that's best for you to make a copy. But kids learn pretty quickly how to file make a copy. There is some organizational um, you know, strategies that you probably want to teach students if you have um, 180 students you work in a high school, you may have them share uh, one folder with you. You may have them turn in their work um, through Google Form and then you have a spreadsheet that you can access to look at individual docs when you're ready. Um, but if you're a class of 30 kids or so, um, <coughs> you may have a different collection workflow. So we're finding that teachers really experiment and find the methods that um, work best for them. Hopefully that helps. Yes, it did. Thanks very much. Um, let's go back to my list here. You know, Peggy, I found a good question. Something just came up. I'd love to address. Great, Sometimes ahead. this can be confusing. Um, somebody had asked, "How often do you use a hyperdoc in the classroom?" Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, you when you're starting out, try it maybe once in the middle of a unit. You know, just to liven up something. Like I used to not like teaching European exploration. And I really um, wanted to liven that up. So I just experimented and tried a one-day hyperdoc with it. Uh, and then it kind of grew from there. I don't use them all day, every day, because I don't have access to technology all day, every day. So start off with just um, really minimal and build from there. Um, I never foresee this being something that you would use all the time. I'm, we love our paper notebooks and <laughs> pencils and you know um, that blended learning. So. Have you gotten any feedback from students as to whether they prefer docs or slides or other apps when working with the hyperdocs? That's a good question. The one feedback we've gotten from students is hilarious. We asked my teenage son who's in high school and <laughs> he likes it with the least amount of words on the page. Oh, he interesting. He that's the least yeah. amount of work. Huh. Which um, uh, we really changed the colors, we changed the look of the um, slides, and had them choose between which which lesson would you use. Um, I think the most important part to it is the content you put on it. So my decision for putting it on a slide is really based on maybe I don't want to link my students um, uh, to a, a video and have them go to YouTube. I want it to be directly on the slide, um, or maybe I want to grade their answer right away after looking at an image or a chart or a video. So I want to package it on a Google form so that the answers come to me in a spreadsheet right away. So really a lot of deciding how to package it comes down to um, workflow. They, um, I haven't had a lot of comments except for if there's too much on a mm -hmm. um, HyperDoc. Uh, I think it's more work. Of course they don't want that. Do students ever create their own hyperdocs? Yes, um, I could uh, talk to that. We we actually do do have students start to create their own hyperdocs. Uh, for example, we talked about multimedia text sets earlier in the webinar, and uh, sometimes what we've done is show the students how to search and research information on their own. And we've shown models of multimedia text sets for them so they can see how to curate their own content. And then when it's time to go uh, do their own research and create their own uh, project around informational literacy, we've had them create their own multimedia text sets because they've had that mentor text. And then they can use that to launch into uh, their other projects. Sometimes, though, we also want to address one of um, the very, and maybe Lisa wants to talk to this, but the very special student who wrote the foreword in our book, uh, this is uh, Lisa's niece actually, and she wrote a foreword in our book about how, why we need to change how we teach. And she would take some of the lessons that her high school teachers were creating and she would put them on a doc and share it with them so they could see um, some of the potential as well. So students can absolutely create hyperdocs for each other. 
if I were a high school teacher, I would definitely just give them the concept and the structure and have them create them for each other. It would be a great way to um, get the kids collaborating and learning. What about classrooms with minimal technology? Will HyperDocs work there? Yeah, I saw that question and the one below it. I can right. address both of those. Right. Thank you. Um, when I, when I, um, in the classroom, uh, you know, I like to say if I had one um, do, um, one device per table group, then I'm good to go. I, I don't love when it's one to one because I don't feel like the students talk to each other enough mm -hmm. or figure things out together. Uh, I love it um, to I just build my lesson with the um, amount of devices I have in the classroom. I did allow students to bring their own device, um, or you know, I, t I wrote a lot of grants just to get one Chromebook per desk, and I think it worked really well. Um, so the kids were working from paper and then going online and sharing that task. Um, the question after that I think is great is, um, have you used it for flipped learning? And I did a lot of flipped teaching um, some years ago. And I feel like this has uh, really helped me evolve my flip teaching because it, I was not comfortable with having kids, um, you know, doing their. I, I don't love homework. I don't assign homework. And then here I was assigning videos uh, at home. I see it more as HyperDocs or just in time teaching. You have the opportunity to package your video tutorials and your extended, you know, explain lessons right in the lesson when they need it and where they need it. Um, so you package those um, uh, videos in the location of the lesson as they need it. I find it to be much more successful, actually. Great. Someone did ask about file size, but I guess it depends on how you create these and where they're stored. Is that correct? Well, sure. We we a lot of our uh, we use Google Drive. So mm -hmm. the Google Drive um, with our, our Google Edu account, we have unlimited storage there. So we do encourage um, teachers and students to use that if you have your district has adopted Google Apps for Education. And also within your drive, when you start designing and creating multiple hyperdocs, your drive will get quite filled up. So we like to show teachers how to use the folders within the drive, and um, you can even share the folders with each other. And so um, we don't have to worry as much about storage with these tools. Okay. And what about printing them? Does that defeat the purpose? Um, I guess it depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your HyperDoc. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, it really depends. Because we, like Lisa mentioned, we wouldn't recommend this for everything because right. a classroom teacher is creating, you know, their whole day as lessons. So a lot of times we may put an activity on the HyperDoc and then work on paper or do a design challenge or they're actually sketchnoting or drawing or doing other types of any educational um, instructional methods that are tried and true. So we don't want to take away from all of those. It's just putting it all together and integrating the technology as well. So definitely a blended environment. And sometimes you do need to just print out things and have kids work in that way. Thank you. Those seem to be the questions that I was able to capture as well as some that came in as we were going along um, with the questions. So thanks very much. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy. Thank you so much, Lisa, Kelly, and Sarah. We have learned so much, and I know everyone is, is as excited as I am about getting started and trying this out. I wanted to quickly wrap up since we've gone a little bit over time, just to let you know we have some amazing shows coming up. We're so excited for this new year. And next week, we're going to hear from Christina 
Cantrell and uh, possibly a couple of her colleagues to tell us all about Letters to the Next President. She did a real quick introduction to that at the end of one of our last webinars. And this is a project that is appropriate for all ages, especially if you're in the United States, but even people outside of our country are interested in what's going on in the U.S. in our elections. So check that out. On August 20th, Matt Bergman is going to be with us as our featured teacher, and he's going to be sharing amazing digital projects for all students with Google tools. On August 27th, Matt Buchanan is joining us to tell us all about a rubric he has created that is free. It's called the Orange Slice Rubric, and it works in lots of subjects. Then we'll take a break for Labor Day weekend, and we'll be back on September 10th with Heidi Samuelson. She has an awesome presentation for classroom resources using technology. And she is an incredible presenter. You're going to be so inspired. And then on September 17th, Laura Krenicki is going to do a fantastic presentation presentation on global literacy and geography resources. We haven't done a whole lot with that. We did global, global Google Maps a while back, but this a whole focus is on geography and literacy. So I know that you're going to love that. So I hope you all come back every Saturday, same time. And if you can't join us live, we will be putting all of it in our archives as a recording. So you can watch it then, or you can share it with others. And Lori, you can quickly wrap us up here. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his resources together, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's public, it's free. As you exit this session, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open. You can also take the link from the chat box or take the tab in the, in the Live Binder in the Resources section. At the very bottom of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. Your name prints on it, thanks to Patty Ruffing. She's the one who sends these out once we get the requests. Special thanks to our special guests, Lisa Highfield, Kelly Hilton, and Sarah Landis. To Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution. To Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform. And to everyone who participated in the show, thanks so much for coming.